Here it is. The Nike Terra Kiger 9. Ninth generation of a trail shoe. I feel like there aren't too many ninth generations of trail shoes. That's what getting kind of old. The Cascadia. They're on like That's Cascadia right. 9000. Um, gosh. The iPhone. The iPhone, if it were a trail shoe. Uh, yeah, there's there's not too many ninth generations of trail shoes out there. They change so much. So is Nike Trail now a veteran in the trail world? It seemed like just yesterday they were this new up and comer. That's our debate question for this episode. Yeah. Is Nike trail a veteran in the trail world now? Yeah, this was a fun one. This was an interesting, uh, I feel like we're going to, we're going to check a lot of boxes in regards to, uh, or we did check a lot of boxes in regards to how we reviewed the shoe and how we tested it. Yes. Yeah, so we got the Nike Terra Kiger 9. Little disclaimer, these shoes were provided to us by Nike and Running Warehouse. But we're under no financial obligation to say whether we like a product or not because we want to keep these reviews authentic and beneficial for you. No one will get to preview or watch this footage before it gets published to YouTube. Uh, a few shoe stats, we'll run through that quickly. Got a $10 price hike over the previous generation Nike Terra Kiger. So this one is now $150 US dollars. Uh, the weight of mine. I got 10.7 ounces, and that's like a very dirty weight. Like you can see how much is, you know, in the upper, which um, I think it started at maybe 10.4 ounces. So now 10.7, size 10. We're looking at 27 and a half millimeters of stack in the forefoot and 32 in the heel, and that's including the insole and the outsole. So the actual midsole foam is probably closer to 20 in the forefoot. Four and a half millimeter drop increased by a one half millimeter over the previous Kigers. I don't know why. Maybe it just was like a, we built the shoe and it is what it is because I challenge anyone to notice a difference between a four and a 4.5 millimeter drop. Uh, going on to the materials, the upper is a very simple and pretty open engineered mesh. Uh, we do have a gusseted tongue and the midfoot wrap is pretty, like it's pretty long, you know, it goes almost the entire length of your arch, which, um, really wraps and locks in that foot. We got a more structured toe bumper than the previous Kigers. There's actually the, the rubber wraps up all the way around the toe and we have there, it's a pretty classic kind of rigid heel cup um pretty like i would say like medium thickness foam what do you think like D decent padding yeah it's it's on the it's on the stiffer side like the foam's on, on the, the stiffer side. narrower side yeah um and then the tongue is very thin but structured it's, just, it's yeah it's structured it's got a couple pads of foam one kind of long laminated overlay to give it a little bit of structure um which is something i've had issues with in the past on nike tongues but this one it seemed totally fine. I had no problems with it folding over on me or anything like that. The midsole is another full length react midsole. So it's very similar to the wild horse, just a little bit less of it. Uh, zoom air unit in the heel gone is the zoom air unit in the forefoot. The Kiger seven and eight had a four foot zoom air unit that is gone. And we're now back to just foam and the segmented rock plate in the forefoot. I asked why they got rid of the forefoot air unit. And I guess uh, a lot of the feedback from the Nike trail team was that it was creating some hot spots on more technical running. So they got rid of that to uh, allow for a little bit more flexibility in the forefoot and not have like a bubble of air. Did you run in the eight? I did, but not as much as I would have liked. I actually loved the feel of the forefoot air unit, but I got a lot of, um, I had a lot of like ankle problems in the eight just due to the, the ankle collar being too floppy. And I actually had like four or five other friends that ran in the Kiger eight that had the same ankle problems, like around the, the post tib tendon on the inside of the ankle. It just stressed it a lot for some reason no issues on the new one. Um, so I think that's just due to increasing the stiffness in the back half of the shoe. The outsole 
is a combination of their high abrasion rubber, um, which I think is just a little bit in the back of the heel. Most of the shoe though is by far their softest rubber compound they've, they've ever used. Um, they call it, I think it's like Miton rubber. Um, I don't know anything about it other than it's pretty soft, it's pretty tacky, and I didn't have any traction issues with this shoe. I believe they uh, said they're six millimeter lugs in the forefoot, so uh, actually same lug depth as the new Wild Horse as well. Finn, you've actually been running in this shoe longer than me because you've had it for quite a bit longer than I have, so I had to kind of cram some miles, but uh, what kind of mileage did you get in this thing? 107 miles in this shoe, a good mix, a little bit in the foothills on runnable trails. Got one long run in on this shoe, a 20 miler with about three hours total time on feet, a lot of everyday mileage. Did two pure hiking days with steep climbs and descents here in Salt Lake City, one on Mount Wire, one on Twin Peaks. Um, we have had a chance to run in the Zagama model and the Wild Horse model of Nike Trail. I think that this is a faster, much more nimble shoe, which we'll get into in a second, but um, enjoyable. Yeah. A lot of mileage. Cool. Yeah. And I went the opposite route. I've actually really only run in the shoe like five times, but one of the runs was the Silver State 50 mile. Um, I ran in the shoe twice the week of the race and then decided, yeah, I'm just going to wing it and go for it at the 50 mile. So I did get in, you know, an eight hour uh, 50 mile with 9,000 feet of climbing and descending. And I covered a massive range of terrain. Like I got buffed out single track and dirt road. I got really technical climbing and descending, both dry and very wet with rocks. Like there was a lot of water coming off of the course. I got to go through some snow fields. Yeah. A lot, yeah. A lot of wet rock, which I was like, really, I didn't know that the course was going to have that. Had I known that I might actually have not worn this shoe. I'm glad I did because all the previous Nike trail shoes just didn't do well on that wet stuff. Um, this, this did just fine. Um, we're going to have a good, what's it for segment based on yeah, that Yeah, we really are. Um, and the reason I chose the shoe for the race was because I just wanted something that, uh, felt really fun to run in. Um, it, you know, kind of like you had said, like we run in the Zagama, we've run in the wild horse eight and this shoe is by far the, like the most nimble of, yeah. of Nike trails, uh, lineup. So I think in total, I got in just around 70 miles in the shoe. I did go for one run after the Silver State 50 in this shoe because I wanted to see how the shoe held up after 50 miles. And um, you, I can't tell that I actually did a 50 mile race in the shoe, which is impressive. Normally you have like a pretty good sized divot of like packed out foam. And again, that React midsole is one of the most durable foams in the game. One material does it all. One material to rule them all. It really, yeah, it really is the only downside is it's a little heavy, but you know, it works, it works well. Um, the how do you feel about the, yeah, I mean, it really could be. It's, I mean, it's, it's one of the best value foams out there. What did you think of the fit? Um, I guess, what did you think of the fit compared to the wild horse? Yeah, I'd have to go back. I, I've actually run in the Zagama, I think m more often, more recently. Actually, I actually did a, a, a long run in the Zagama on a whim like two weeks ago. Um, so I'll compare it to that. No points of irritation in the shoe. That was a big thing for me. It, similar to not the tectonics, but the speed land. It felt out of the box, comfortable. Like it was specifically made for my foot, very breathable, um, lightweight upper. Once everything was laced up highly secure around the midfoot. I think we'll talk about it in a second, but I really liked the new like midfoot saddle support. I think I haven't run in the eight version of this shoe, but I think that was a new addition to the upper of this version. Um, and especially on those technical runs I did like on Mount wire and twin peaks, um, I think that that midfoot saddle support made for um, easier running and support on like technical steep downhill sections. There was that. Uh, we talked about the padded heel cup earlier. I liked that. And wider toe box for me. I, I definitely have a wider forefoot, um, plenty of room up front. Um, I think we'll talk about the upper more in a second, but yeah, very stretchy. I think this keeps the weight of the shoe down. I mean, yeah, just like some extra overlays in the forefoot, like these kind of interesting bumpers here. Um, I did hit yeah, a it's couple like actually rocks. rubber on the front. Yeah, like actual rubber. On the, I hit a bunch of rocks on a lot of these runs, and I just definitely felt the protection in action there. So, yeah, but I think if I understand correctly, a lot of the biggest changes to the shoe were made in the upper, and I like them. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, I mean, this is usually the Kyger runs on a, a full redesign every two years sort of basis. So like Kyger seven was a full redesign over Kyger six. And then Kyger eight was just a slight tweaks to the seven. So now Kyger nine is a full redesign um, where they changed, you know, the entire shape of the shoe. And I think pretty much everything that they changed was for the better. Um, I, I, think this is like the highest volume forefoot that a Kyger has ever had. Yeah, um, definitely. And it, and it didn't come at the sacrifice of midfoot or heel lockdown. Um, that was something that has been an issue for me. The forefoot gets too big. The midfoot also gets bigger. The heel gets wider. And then my foot just slides around. I was able to really still lock my foot down um, while having nice room in the forefoot. Traditionally, the Kyger's, uh, the forefoot has like sloped down a ton to the toe and then you, you, the tops of your toes like have no wiggle room up and down. This uh, still does that a little bit, but nowhere near as much as Kyger's in the past, which is a huge, huge plus. I did like the additional stiffness uh, in the back half of the shoe, you know, with the mid midfoot being a little stiffer and the heel being stiffer the one thing i did notice though is that because this foam is on the stiffer side and it really does hug all around my heel and ankle so much that i had some pretty significant bruising on the side like the outside of my ankle after that silver state 50 mile because when i was jamming down like technical rocky stuff uh trails the you know, the shoe would kind of jam up into my ankle bone. Nothing that I noticed during the race, um, just like very sore for about a week afterwards. Probably worth it though, because had I not had that additional security, you know, that would have been a detriment to the actual race day performance. So I don't think I'm going to call that like a negative or anything like that. From a sizing standpoint, it fit exactly the same as the wild horse. I wouldn't be surprised if they were even built on like the same last. Uh, they just feel like very similar shape and length, which is nice. So, you know, if the wild horse and even the Zagama, if either of those fit, this Kyger will also fit. Um, so it yeah. kind of adds into the rotation. And it's really nice that Nike trails like sizing like that is very consistent. I guess on the con to that is like if one of these doesn't fit you, the other ones probably aren't going to fit you. Yeah, I guess, so moving on to the, like, actual feel while running, you know, we had mentioned, like, it's a very nimble, it's a fast-feeling shoe. That was definitely what Nike intended for it to be. I was a little worried, because it seems like every year the night the Kyger gets a little bit beefier, and, like, I think this might be the heaviest Kyger that they've ever made, but I wouldn't say it feels any slower. And, and still lighter than the Zagama and the Wild Horse. Oh, yeah, it's, like, at least a full ounce lighter than the Zagama, ounce and a half full lighter than the lighter. Wild Horse. But one thing of the, like, so there's a big exposed chunk of midsole foam underneath. I was worried about that in terms of like rock protection stuff. The React foam is dense enough where I didn't have any protection issues underneath my arch. Did you have any problems with the exposed section? No problem, but didn't, th in this version, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't they add like a, a flexible rock plate to this version that they didn't it's, have in the eight. It's only in the forefoot. So it's, it's like, in the forefoot. yeah, it's like three pieces of plastic that go across the shoe in the forefoot. Um, there used to be a rock plate in the heel, but that's gone. I don't, God, I don't know how I feel about the rock plate in the forefoot. Like it works when the rocks hit the plate, but I feel like the gaps are almost so big between the sections of the plate that I still felt a lot of rocks when I was running. Um, making it a full length rock plate though, with no segments is gonna sacrifice the flexibility of the forefoot. So perhaps Nike made this decision because a full length rock plate just didn't feel good. Um, but I would, I would be curious to see what a full length rock plate felt like with the shoe. Cause I felt myself wishing that there was a little bit more rock protection on some of the more technical trails of that silver state 50 mile course. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I definitely expected coming in with the shoe, given that it's lighter and just less built out than the Zagama and the wild horse, that there'd be more of a ground feel. I personally thought that that, uh, 
rock plate in the forefoot helped enough on technical running, but mm-hmm. I can totally see your points there as well. Yeah. I, um, I did love climbing in this shoe because of how much flex the forefoot has. Like, I feel like it just, it just bent with my foot. And like, that's just, we've tested a lot of it's, stiffer shoes recently. It's the react compound. Uh, yeah. It's the react know. foam. And I think due to it being a little you bit, can put this into too, a ball. I know. Yeah. It's um, so I love that flexibility in the spring that it has to it. Um, but that doesn't carry on all the way to the heel. Usually a shoe that wobbly or that flexible. If you throw that in the heel, you're going to be all over the place. Um, but the heels, you know, stiffened up enough where I, I really liked the blend of the balance of the flexibility in the forefoot and then the stiffness and protection in the heel. Oh my gosh. I've been flexing the shoe and there's so much dirt on my desk now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I got to ask you a question. What is, what would be their rationale for leaving so much of this out outsole exposed without any lug there? I bet they realized they just don't need it. Like if you add outsole rubber there, you're just going to add another ounce of weight um, and you're going to increase the stiffness of the shoe even more. Um, So this is going to allow the forefoot and the heel to kind of flex independently with each other, which is going to help a lot on uneven terrain. Um, I imagine that's probably why they've they've been experimenting the last few iterations of the Kyger having an exposed section of foam in the middle. And I think that works really well with this React foam. I did have one issue though. That my Kyger, or I guess both of our Kygers, and maybe all of them moving forward for this Kyger 9, did not come with glued down insoles. Every Kyger I've ever worn, as well as I think every wild horse I've ever worn, the insoles came glued down, where there was a ton of dots of glue in the forefoot. And I love that because I knew that there was going to never be an issue with my insoles moving around. That happened to me during my 50 mile race. Um, I had gone through enough water and creek crossings where, like, the shoe was fully saturated and I was going down a pretty steep technical descent around 20 miles in. And I thought that I had like a bunch of rocks or debris up towards the toe. And I stopped and took my shoe off because it was bugging me enough. It was actually the insoles had slid forward, folded over and were curling up at the toe uh, because it's a pretty flexible insole. So gotcha. If you're going to be doing a race where you know your feet are going to get wet and you're going to be descending some steeper stuff, there is that chance that the insoles could slide forward. Um, I was able to fix them and I just had to tie the shoes really tight to make sure that there was no moving around, which was not very comfortable. It did fix the problem, but it was something that I was definitely a little bit bummed about. And it happened on both, both shoes. So like both insoles were like an inch forward um, and like my heel had no insole underneath it um and how far into the race did that happen again i apologize like 20 miles so then i think i fixed it at 22 and then i still had 28 miles to go of wow the shoes tied like as tight as i could tie them which is you know it wasn't particularly comfortable so that was a bit of a bummer say maybe that like marathon 50k distance is sort of the tipping point where you'd start to see the limitations of the shoe exposed but 22 miles that's that's slightly early well i don't think it had anything to do with the distance i think it was the fact that the shoes got fully wet and then the insoles got to they got they became more slippery underneath gotcha. uh, like under this insoles the strobel board of the shoe and it, when you get those parts wet like the insole just started to slip so that that was an issue that i had with the shoe that was really the only fit issue i had and then from a durability standpoint like i am surprised my outsole has virtually nowhere even after a 50 mile trail race that was pretty rocky and like i was trying pretty hard on some of those sections i thought i would have sheared off a lug or chipped the rubber or something um how do yours look they're great yeah and even put together i and you know i got almost double the mileage and uh they're in great shape yeah i think um yeah this this outsole and the wild horse outsole are very good. The Zagama outsole, eh, not very good. I mean, it's fine on dry stuff, but like wet stuff, it's still like their old school rubber. But I think like the tipping point started at wild horse eight and now this Kyger nine, like, I don't know, maybe, maybe we would get, we're going to get blasted for this in the comment section, but I think this outsole rubber is pretty good. It's excellent. 
Yeah, it's crazy. Um, well, okay. Would you race in it? I did race in it. Would you race in it? I I would race a 50K and below. I think it's been advertised as a 50K and below type racer. I know we're going to be talking about the on cloud venture very soon. Um, I'm not sure that I'm going to this shoe for like a trail 10K or a trail half marathon or like 30K mm -hmm. and below, but I could totally see myself lining up locally here for like the speed goat 50k in this shoe for example um so you'd feel comfortable it. taking it on like a pretty burly 50k course as well i would yeah and only because i i you know in in testing out the shoe i took it on some pretty burly loose scree field type uh hill climbs and descents so um yeah in the nike catalog at least if, if we're talking about racing within the nike catalog totally i, I mean if we're talking about racing like outside of the night what if you're racing speed good this year what shoe are you pulling of the Probably ones the, that you've run the hoka mafate you would go mafate for the speed, I'd go for speed, for the speed okay guy. yeah if we're going outside the catalog yeah. um because i think and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about it in a second i've never personally raced in the Saucony peregrine but just looking at it i feel like this shoe is kind of comparable i have run a fair bit in the hoka torrent i feel like this is somewhat comparable to the hoka torrent um and i'm not racing in a torrent at speed goat okay yeah um so i did race the silver state 50 mile in it would i do that again i don't think i would and my reason for that is well i guess the insoles even if the insole situation never happened i don't think i would race the silver state 50 in the shoe again and the reason for that is because the shoe was really fun but at times it was like so nimble and i felt so much underfoot that I found myself like really having to kind of tiptoe some sections where had I had say something like a Mafate, I think I would have been able to just like monster truck a few of the rocky sections. So I think for that reason, while the shoe was really fun and I felt really nimble, I think if I had just gone for a beefier shoe, I would have actually run faster because I would have just been able to descend a little bit more recklessly. But yeah, so uh, yeah, uh, what, did, what did Nike design the shoe for? and does it hold true so nike called it it says on their on their tech sheet it says rapid trail and racing i don't know what rapid trail is like i guess it's just like fast trail um like rapido so yeah rapid trail and racing i mean this is definitely a shoe i would do i i would absolutely pull the shoe for trail workouts you know doing like uphill downhill intervals and those sorts of things this would be a great shoe for that I think it does slot in right into that racing category. But my question is, when would you pull this to race in over, say, the upcoming Nike Ultrafly other than the price? Like, is there ever a scenario now where this Kyger would be raced in over the new Ultrafly? I mean, I, I, like one response I would have to that is like, okay, so like there's a lot of probably ultra running fans that are listening to this episode right now. And you and I were talking offline earlier that there might be a lot of Nike athletes that will turn to the ultra fly for the last hundred K of the race. If they're staying within the Nike catalog, are they using something like the Terra Kiger in the first 50 K of that race? Oh, for like Western States. Um, like, okay. So if I'm a Nike athlete and I'm running Western States this year, I'm probably wearing the wild horse for the first 50 K. And then switching into the ultra fly for the last, you know, what is that? 100K. I would want a little bit more protection underfoot than what this Kyger has for the first 50K of Western states. And, and I don't, I, I wouldn't want something this minimal. I wouldn't want my foot to be working any harder than it needs to be for something like Western states. And then for like any 50K, like we already said, like, you know, not probably not going to pull this shoe for the Speedgo no. 50K. If I'm a Nike athlete and I'm running the speed go 50k, I wouldn't, I probably just wear the ultra fly because I'm not sure if, you know, I'm actually going to run any faster in this Kyger. Does this, does this Nike shoe have no place in an ultra trail running environment in your opinion, if you're a Nike athlete, given everything else that exists in their catalog, is this purely like a, a workout shoe? I think, I mean, if I'm a Nike athlete, I'm going like, you know, wild horses, gamma for the long stuff. And then ultra fly for everything else. If I'm not a Nike athlete and I love Nike shoes, 
I would do all my short faster stuff in this Kyger simply because it's a hundred dollars cheaper than the Ultrafly. You know, like the Ultrafly is not going to be a cheap shoe and now it's a very expensive shoe to train in. So I think that's why that's why the Kyger is still going to exist, which you know kind of brings us into the value segment. It's 150 bucks. Like so Great we value. named some of the shoes that it competes against. Like uh I actually wrote I wrote a list of some shoes that I thought it you know competed in. And you actually you named a few of them the Hoka Torrent. Um I would say the Zanal fits in there as well. The Zanal is 160, the yeah. Torrent's 130 the Saucony Peregrine was, I think, 140. I would say the Solomon Sense Ride and the Pulsar Trail Pro 2 compete against this Kyger. Um, I think those were 130 and 160. The Brooks Catamount definitely falls into this category, I believe was also 160. So this being at 150 kind of slots right into a very, uh, a very competitive segment of m- midweight kind of fun trail shoes um i will say though i bet with the exception of maybe the peregrine i bet i'm getting the most miles out of this kyger than all the competitor models that are listed what do you think agreed agreed 100 yeah. percent. yeah I mean, I there's just, there's a durability factor here yeah so again you know we, and as we, love we react. said as we said with the wild horse, I think a large amount of the value is the number of miles that you'll actually get in a shoe like this. So, and yeah, I did a run after I ran yesterday in these shoes and even after a 50 mile race, there's like no packing out of the foam, no big indent of, of my foot, you know, the upper is not stretched out in any way. So it, the shoe is holding up very well. Um, so I think, I think mucho points for, for durability, um, adding to the value of the shoe. And I definitely think it's $10 better than the previous generation Kyger, simply because I'm able to run in it without getting injured. Um, that's worth $10 to me. But, what's, the, uh, the, what's, what's the debate question for the audience? I mean, yeah, I, I guess, one, there's a lot of people who've worn a lot of Kygers. What is your favorite generation Kyger? Because, you know, the hardcore Nike Trail fans will say Nike Kyger 1 was the best Kyger in existence. And as you get further and further away from Kyger 1, it just keeps getting better in your mind. Everyone's already forgotten the fact that it lasted 100 miles before the tread was gone. Um, but uh, there's a lot of there's been a lot of good generations of Kygers out there. So what's your favorite Kyger? The other question is, like, I actually don't really know, like, between, like, Zagama, Wild Horse, Kyger. I don't think you need all three in your shoe closet. So like, which one or two are you picking? Like, do you need the Kyger and Wild Horse in your lineup? I'm not, I'm not sure I do, but like, which, which one are you picking? Or, you know, Wild Horse or Zagama? Other question I had written down was, is Nike Trail about to make a case for like the comeback company of the year? Yes. I'm saying yes. I feel very strongly about that. Because I, I feel loved... like their 2023 lineup of shoes is kind of fire. And last year, they all kind of sucked. The last few years, they actually kind of sucked. But this year, I feel like at the moment, like Nike Trails like can't do any wrong with their shoes. And like they're not done yet. There's there's more coming up uh, very soon. Um, yeah, and if... if uh, if you do want to try these shoes and your local run specialty shop does not carry them, feel free to use our link below to try out the uh, Nike Terra Kyger 9 from our friends at Running Warehouse. Your purchase uh, helps support the channel, allows us to continue to do more reviews like this. And one last thing, make sure to like and comment on this video and subscribe to Conversational Pace. It's so close to 1,000 subscribers. Subscribe below. 